Hi, I'm Betsy Styron, and I'm the president of the Center for Application of Psychological Type. And we are lucky enough today to have Elizabeth Murphy with us, who is the co-author of the MMTIC assessment, a personality assessment. And Elizabeth, it is wonderful to have you in Gainesville. Thank you. So Thank you. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> so that we can talk about the MMTIC and how to use type with children. Great. One of so, my favorite topics. And you are certainly uh, experienced and expert in that field. So, <laughs> so I'm curious though, because I don't know that I've ever asked you, asked you this, how did you first get interested in psychological type and using it with children? Well, uh, when I discovered it for adults, I was already interested in looking for climate ways to make adult-child relationships better. Mm. And I was like, well, if this works for adults, surely it could work for children, too. Mm -hmm. And because the child had to have the right to self-report, they needed a tool. And that's how the birth of the MTIG began, was to try to create a tool to let the kids discover the same joy of knowing who they are that adults got to know. Mm -hmm. um, I had two children of my own. I still do. And they uh, would be taught concepts of type. And then they would start teaching their friends and they would start telling their friends about type. And I figured, well, you know what? If you think this is important enough for you to share with your friends in your leisure time, then it had some underlying value for you that was real. Um, and then it got to the point when my daughter went off to college her first year, she called me and she said, Mom, can you set up some of those MBTIs? I want to give them to some of my friends. And I said, honey, you're not eligible. <laughs> you are not certified to use the tool. And she goes, but I understand it. I know what it's like. And I said, yes, and you're seeing that it has value for your friends too. And so let's figure out how we can get you certified. And so after she graduated, she then did take the course so that she could also use type. When I first started using it with kids, it was amazing. There would be some people who would say, there's no way they can understand this stuff. But then every time you'd work with the children, they would clearly get it. Now, did they remember all the vocabulary? No. But they really understood how things work. And I think one of my favorite stories that started type was a story about the dog food cans at our house. <laughs> um, my son has ESTP preferences. My husband had ISTJ preferences. And my daughter, INFJ. And they came home for grocery shopping, and my son, in his whatever style, was throwing the dog food cans in the cupboard any way they go. My husband, in his sense of order style, was cringing. <laughs> my daughter, seeing the feeling side of her noticing dad cringing, turns to my young son and says, just put them in daddy's way. He looks at my husband and says, oh, yeah, sure. And he turns them and faces them all label front. Now, That's a great story. he didn't know that he was responding to type, but he clearly understood his natural way wasn't the same mm -hmm. as my husband's natural way. But my daughter's sensitivity to those were able to communicate a pattern that all of a sudden fixed a problem. And it wasn't a discipline or a respect issue. It was just simply a, if I could have done it my way, they would have just gone in. But if you need them another way, sure, I can accommodate. So when little things like that would happen, it convinced me that type is real for kids and it would be actually cruel in my mind to withhold a tool that could help them become better at who they are when they're young. Why do we have to wait till we're 40 to get to know how wonderful we are? That's, that's <laughs> absolutely so. And when the Myers-Briggs type indicator was created, really it was mostly for adults. It and is. so until you had the idea to develop a, an assessment that measured type in children, that kind of rounded out the whole circle yeah. so a whole family could be involved so the parents know their mm -hmm. type. And then when they take the MMTEC, the children now know their type. Right. And so everyone in the whole family can, can uh, understand each other, one, one another better. A question, if you have a family of five, um, you know, how often do you have the differences that you had in your own family? Well, we were kind of unique because we had four totally different approaches to the world. And there are families that I've worked with where three of the family will all share a common type 
and then another child will not. Mm -hmm. And when the parents both share the same type, like I had a case where both parents preferred ISTJ and they were blessed enough to have an ESFP daughter. But that ESFP style and approach to life to them didn't look prepared, didn't look organized, didn't look um, ready to get things done every day in the same way that they would get done. Mm -hmm. So type gave them a way of finding what was wonderful about her and holding her accountable for all the family rules and all the family values. And one of the most important things that families with these differences learn is that I'm not abandoning my value that everybody sit down to dinner or that everybody be on time and be ready to leave the house when it's mm -hmm. time to go, but that your way of getting ready to leave the house and their way of getting to leave the house could be so different that the only rule is if it's noon and we said we're leaving at noon, are you ready to go at noon? Not, did you prepare the way I would have prepared? Mm -hmm. And it's also helpful when we give parents a, a way of looking at things so that if the child says something so outlandish, you could say, well, that is that is one perspective. Uh, can I share another with you? And then we can talk about which one might be a better one for you to choose so that the power and the autonomy of the child remains with the child when they have the right to make the choice. But sometimes they need information to make wise choices. And sometimes parents who don't understand that will think that a child's right to choose means we just leave them with the resources they currently have, where type allows us to give them more resources so they can choose more wisely. Do you find that you with your own children and the people that you teach type to, do they learn to frame their questions or directions to the child so that the child either understands better or changes their behavior in some way? I think they learn to ask the questions and phrase the discipline in less threatening ways. But they also learn to phrase things so that it works well for them. For instance, I had a mom who was a J preference and a son who had a perceiving preference. This is not my story, but it is another family story. And the mother would say to the child on Friday, you need to hurry up and get your homework done so you can relax all weekend. Well, that perceiving child had no need to get the homework done mm -hmm. on Friday night because I have till Sunday night to do it. But the judging parent would use the language of, but you need to, so you will be able mm -hmm. to relax. So all we did was rechange, reframe the language for the parent to say, my job as your parent is to check your homework and I can't enjoy my weekend until I have finished that job. Mm -hmm. So homework has to be done Friday night so I can enjoy the rest of my weekend. Well now the child said, okay, because I'm meeting your need. When the parent was saying, you need to, the child was canceling that out as, but that's not true. I don't need to. So sometimes it isn't even in making it easier for the child or changing the task at all, as much as making clear for the child, why are you really doing this? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. Do you find that parents have a hard time adjusting to the differences and wanting the parent, the parent wants the child to be more like them? Uh, I don't find that as much. I think the hardest thing was that parents have to sort what is a discipline issue from what is a type issue. Because when it's a type difference, you want to accommodate it. You want to enrich it. You want to allow it to grow and so the child can become the best at their way. Mm -hmm. When it's a discipline issue, the child's doing something wrong and they need to be told stop it. So helping the parent to be able to identify the style at reaching the objective is allowable. Not reaching the objective or doing something inappropriate is not. Mm -hmm. And so that should deserve a consequence. I'd like to change from, from family to school a little bit. To okay. Just to say, because as you describe the parent who wants the child to get their homework done right. earlier. When it comes to a teacher and type differences, I'm assuming that the same applies it does. at some level. It does. And usually on the JP scale is where we find homework issues more than on others. 
if it's getting it done. If it's processing the information, we'll be on the SN scale. But on the JP scale is that planning, the timing of getting it done. And kids with a J preference tend to have an internal clock that is just more accurate. Mm -hmm. Perceivers tend to have a clock that underestimates how long something might take to do. Because we know the perceiver is going to get energy at the last moment, asking them to start working too early is not using their best brain time. Mm -hmm. So what we tell the teachers are forward chaining or backward chaining. Forward planning is when you say here's when it's due and here's what you have done now. Plan forward for how you can get it done. But backward planning is what is the last minute you can start and still get it done. And perceiving kids react to that language much better. And because they may not estimate possible interferences, you can throw out some. So like what would happen if uh, you'd lose electricity like they did last week when the storm came through? Well, then I'd have to. The, the problem is that sometimes J adults think that's going to tell the child to think J ways. But what it does is it is inspires them to think creatively of, so if I lose the power, how else can I get it done? <laughs> and I keep saying to them, it doesn't matter. What matters is if it was due on Monday, it's due on Monday. And if it's not in on Monday, whatever consequence you would give for failure to complete an assignment, you would give. And it doesn't matter what song and dance they have about, well, I really did, I tried, I worked hard. It's like, okay, so what would you need to do next time so that your working hard worked for you? Mm -hmm. So effort doesn't get it. The task, the, the job gets done. And our tool is to help them do that job to the best of their ability in the easiest way and best way for them. But um, perceiving kids just are going to start from the deadline and work backwards. That's how they think in terms of product. But it's not laziness. And a lot of people want to call it laziness. Yeah. And it's not laziness. It's letting the ideas simmer until they are just exactly right and then they're produced. Do you think that this uh, perceiving judging difference is um, one of the biggest places for conflict between parents and children and, and teachers and, and students? It's the biggest place for what I call living conflicts. Just living in the same space. Mm. The J and the P and the E and the I seem to cause irritations more. Mm. When it's information processing, it's going to be the S and the N. When it's relationships and decision making, it's going to be more on the TF scale. So if I'm trying to teach you a concept, the JP may not be a factor at all. But if I'm helping you plan for when things are going to get done, then it, then it really does come into play a little bit more. Well, let's talk a little bit about the introversion, extroversion scale and the implications in the family when you have a, a child who has a preference for extroversion and both of the parents are introverts, let's say. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, impact does that have? <laughs> well, in our family we had three introverts and one extrovert. Oh my. And I feel like we never fairly modeled for him how to be an extrovert. He had to learn that from other people in his life because we were our own style. As an adult, um, my extroverted adult child and I were watching a movie together and at the end of the movie, I said, oh my gosh, I haven't laughed so hard in years. I said, that was hysterical. And he looked at me and he said, mom, not a single sound has come out of your mouth. <laughs> and I said, you're <laughs> kidding me. <laughs> he said, no, I'm sitting here thinking, boy, I made her sit here and watch this movie and I'm feeling bad that I made her watch <laughs> this movie with me and how could she not even be enjoying this? But inside, I was so active mentally and so actively enjoying it, that it totally escaped my knowledge that I hadn't shown mm. that to the world. Mm. So when I'm working with introverted kids and introverted adults, I say sometimes you have to manage yourself and make sure the world gets some signal for what is processing within you. Yes. Because they can't guess at it. They need some feedback they element. They need some. And I think extroverts may need it more than introverts is what I hear you saying. Well, extroverts need that feedback mm -hmm. so that they can react to it. Um, and then sometimes 
they need to understand that the pause space, the wait time for introverts in family life and in business life and in school life is different. Mm -hmm. So that when an introvert has paused, the extroverts would already be going, yeah, yeah, come on, spit it out, get it out, right? You, you're taking too long. But for an introvert, that was just a gentle pause. Mm -hmm. For an extrovert, that was a dead zone. Nothing happening, so it's let's get some action going. <laughs> Which means they then jump in and take over. And then you get things like, you always talk, you never let anybody else have a turn to talk. And they'll be like, well, nobody else takes a turn to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, so you just come up with some rules and systems for allowing it. But I remember one that used to really get me is uh, my extrovert used to go, hey, mom, mom. Mom, mom. <laughs> and I finally just said to him, honey, I know it looks like I'm not doing anything, but I have an inside channel that is just broadcasting great stuff. And I have to turn off that channel and open up one to hear you. So after you say mom, you're not allowed to say it again until you count to 10. <laughs> <laughs> after you count to 10, you can say it again if I haven't answered you yet. And it worked great. They used to make a game out of trying to beat me. but they had to understand that there was a mental process and going on. I wasn't just standing there doing nothing, even though that's what it looked like. Well, so it was a, teaching them mutual respect, I guess. In a, in a family where type isn't known, yeah. um, and let's say it's the same composition of the family that you have, yeah. how is that extroverted child misunderstood? Oh, it, <laughs> well, even before we used type, we'd get things like, he'd go, mom, 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 and I'd go, what? <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be like, what are you mad about? I'm not mad about anything. What do you want? I don't want to talk to you if you're in a bad mood. I'm not in a bad <laughs> mood. What do you want? <laughs> and he'd be like, because the tone and everything else about it was, I was interrupted. I was annoyed. Yes. But I didn't have a reason for it. So I pretended like I wasn't, that the whole relationship takes and on a And he really flavor. didn't understand that he was interrupting. No. He just wanted, to get, your, he just wanted to get your attention and to initiate what he wanted. Yeah. And so well, you're not doing anything. So why not? I can come up. Because we hadn't taught them about our differences. Mm -hmm. So once we teach them about our differences, then all of a sudden my standing there alone, quiet, doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing nothing. It comes up with then, hey, Mom, can I talk to you for a minute? A whole different deal. But it's because of the mutual respect you can engender when everybody in the family understands about type. Yeah, I was, was going to say that once the family knows about type, then all of a sudden you have the language exactly. that you can use so that what may be annoying um, or misunderstood, it's, uh, you know, it may still be annoying or misunderstood, right. but at least everybody has that common language right. that, that, you can act, that you can talk about it. I remember a story once and it was the uh, mom was an introvert sitting alone on the couch and the little kid ran inside and said, Mom, are you lonely or is it just that introverted stuff and you want some time alone? <laughs> and she said, I just need a moment alone. Okay, cool. But if you were lonely, I'd stay. No, I'm fine. <laughs> you can go. But it gives them a way to frame the behavior from a normal perspective first and then a need perspective. So what happens when um, a family knows about type yeah. But the teachers at school don't know about mm -hmm. type. How does that, how does that uh, conversation go? <laughs> <laughs> well, you coach the parents on how to help the teacher learn about the differences. Mm -hmm. And if you go in with, my child needs, my child is, they're probably not going to hear you as well. Mm -hmm. But if you do say things like, I found a question I asked my child really helped me with his homework, and I don't know if that same question would help you. but I asked them to, to just fill in the blank. When I get stuck on my homework, it really helps me if you, and so I don't know, if you tried that at school, when you get stuck on an assignment, it would really help me if you, mm. let him fill that in for you. So instead of teaching them all about type at first, I'm gonna teach them specific strategies that are gonna work with that child. And then when the teacher comes back and says, oh boy, that idea really worked, or oh, that backward planning really worked with this person, or helping them with the spot to go where it really helped that person. Then I say, oh, it's just based on a theory that's just been wonderful for helping adults and children find their best way for getting through the life. It's, uh, it's called type. 
that uh, if you ever feel like reading more about it, I can help you with it. How? So instead of jamming it down their throat, you teach it through the strategies, and then you go to the theory. Versus, let me tell you all about the theory first. Uh, that's my opinion. Well, I was gonna, what I was going to read to ask you is, how early can you see type in children? <laughs> um, well, I am doing research that we can document differences at nine months. I think you can see them prenatally sometimes. I know you can see them in infancy. Um, we just haven't always had good definitions so that they're not processing. For instance, we always say that a thinking child is logical and reasonable. Well, uh, the logic of a four-year-old is not the same as the logic of an adult. Mm -hmm. But there is a characteristic of the T child, which is a love of independence, and I have to do it on my own. That seems to be present from the moment they can utter a sound, not a word, <laughs> a sound. But that love of mastering worlds, of being in charge of me, seems to be present in our T kids from a very young age, as the, well as the relationship draw for the F kids. So people say, well, they don't know how to tell us that's their type. I said, that's true. But it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it exists from unconscious drives. So they don't know about differences. They only know what way makes most sense to them. But for a parent who has a T child, they will get annoyed sometimes when they're helping their child and they start to help the child and the child is invested in that help and then all of a sudden they go, okay, leave me alone, I got it. And the parent goes, no, let me just help you finish it. No, I got it, leave me alone. And they'll be like, no, go away. And all of a sudden it's like, here we started out working so nicely together, now they don't want. But if a parent has a T child, they should go in with saying, help me, as, uh, let me help you as far as you need my help and when you say you've got it on your own, you signal me and I'll be done. But remember how sometimes when you have racers and you have pacers and the pacer kind of comes in and helps for a while and then leaves and comes in and helps for a while and leaves. If you need me to come back in, just give me a signal. So you get a family agreed upon signal about when you leave me alone and when to have them come help me. Because a lot of times the child will think I can do it on my own but run into another bump. And they don't want the parent coming in and going, I ah, see, if I'd stayed here, you wouldn't have had that bump. We want them to have the bump because we want them to manage their own life, manage their own energy, manage their own learning, but we want to be there to coach as we need to. And so what you've just done is frame the language the parent can exactly. use, and which is such excellent communication right. that the child then feels valued. And empowered. And empowered. To be, yeah. it's his assignment or her assignment. But more than importantly to me is I can teach any parent to say, give me a signal when you think you want to handle it on your own and give me a signal when you think you need my help again. And they can do that. They can do that right now. They don't have to study for five days and ten days of theory. So when you're watching a small child yeah. and these, which I love to do. <laughs> with these preferences are starting to yeah. emerge, and you talked about the uh, child with thinking preferences being independent, what about um, a child with a preference for feeling decision making? How, do, how does that uh, show itself uh, to the parent? With a feeling child, a lot of times people get cuddly mixed up with feeling and it has nothing to do with it. You can have a thinking child who's very cuddly and likes to hug and sit on your lap. But a feeling child gets very tuned into the needs and the emotions of the moment. So <laughs> I was uh, playing a board game with my grandchildren and their parents. So there were uh, five of us. And one grandchild is F and one grandchild is T. The T child realizes he's going to lose and there's no strategy he can use to win and is getting very upset. So he's disappointed with the game and doesn't think he wants to finish the game. So the F granddaughter starts crying. <laughs> <laughs> and the dad says, why are you crying? And she goes, because my brother feels so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at me and go, and what, what do we do? And do I do? say, yeah. you honor both. You say, son, it, it's hard when you thought you had a good winning strategy and it didn't work and you have to come up with a new plan. And it's hard to see people we love hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just shows what wonderful way you bring to the world 
what you notice best. So let's think of a way to help brother come up with better strategies. And let's think of a way to let sister know it's okay. When I fall down, I can pick myself back up and keep trucking. But I have to be allowed to feel badly for a moment. Life isn't about always feeling wonderful. It's about knowing that when the waves come, I have the skills and energy to handle the waves because everybody's going to get a, a negative wave. Nobody gets through life without having a problem. Well, it's just mm -hmm. such a, a lovely framework for differences that you know, my way may be different mm -hmm. from your way. Both are good. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is uh, we're, the theory says that we're born with our preferences. So therefore, um, in a family, you're going to have these differences. And, and there's, you can create an appreciation, if not right. necessarily behavior change in a child. Yeah. It's not to say that the same situation wouldn't happen in, another, in another game, but at least you now have a common language. Right. But if the parent could also get to the point where they offer the child the option of self-reflection. So it could have been, hmm. So if that were me, I'd be plotting for what did I do wrong or what could I notice about the way they put their pieces so that I could win next time. But you, of course, could choose another strategy. Mm -hmm. And the door is always open. Or if a child can't unlock the back door, whatever little silly thing it is, it's like, hmm, if that were my problem, I'd probably think about getting the stool and standing on that. But I don't know. What are you thinking? You might want to try anything other than that. So that instead of telling the child, just go get the stool and stand on it. <laughs> which means you as the adult did the thinking and the child didn't have to do any thinking, which doesn't help them at all. They had to learn. They had to learn. Yeah. But when we give them a model, which is, if this were my problem, I might approach it this way, but there's a lot of ways. Is there another way you might consider? Then so you open that door to self-reflection, yet you have the hint of, no, I think I could do your way today. So if you see children who come from a family that has knowledge about you know, these differences, mm -hmm. Uh, how does it play out with friends? Uh, are, do the, is the child able to say, I need this, or and communicate those differences? How does, how does that work? Child friend to child friend mm -hmm. or child friend to parents? To child friend to child friend. Oh, yeah. That's why I say, when my kids were younger, they taught their friends about type <laughs> because they said, hey, this is cool, some stuff about here. And this is how we come we think this way, or this is how come we act this way. And you teach them to respect the same language that I said the parent needed to do with a child, a friend sometimes needed to do with a friend. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, if my boyfriend broke up with me or if my boyfriend did that to me, I might want to feel like this, but I'd probably do this, but I don't know, is that something that would work for you? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're, again, telling them there's another perspective, but not telling them what to do or say or think. So yes, it generalizes. And I would think if we had this for a couple generations, businesses would be lauding the idea that they no longer have to do as much training on team building. <laughs> well, <laughs> learning how <laughs> to appreciate each other and we all intuitively know whether we know something about type or not that there are definitely differences in how we right. deal with situations, how we deal with people, right. how we organize things. Right. There are these differences. So ultimately uh, as children, if children can learn about it early in life, yes. then that knowledge just carries forward until you get into a business situation exactly. where you can say, this is how I like to do it, or maybe you're doing it in a particular way right. that, could, uh, that we could work more cooperatively. And whether it's in the family or whether it's in business, there are going to be people who aren't functioning based on type. Yes. They're running by a different set of rules, mm -hmm. laziness, mm -hmm. something else. Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, you don't want to tolerate it. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have to give the parents enough information about the differences so that they can sort what is just a stylistic way that they're approaching the task. This is just from a preference, doing it. one, you know, like being right-handed and left-handed, one but I can preference over another. But I can still maintain my standards. I can still maintain my expectations. Mm -hmm. So if the work is due at noon, it's work. It's new. It's due. Whether you're 45 and in the office or five and in kindergarten, 
It's so same. it's not necessarily your ability or your intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's Nothing. just how you approach things and, and find that energy or mm -hmm. how you look at it. But it does give you a vocabulary to explain yeah. how people are different from one another. And to appreciate that difference. Because there are stages in this developmental process and the, and the young child is just unconsciously driven. They have to be who they are. And then they discover their rules of society. What are what am I supposed to be doing? And then they discover, hey, I'm pretty cool. <laughs> I'm pretty cool. You, you're not me, and I don't want to be you because I don't like your way. You're, you're okay for you, but I don't want to be you. But that's not a valuing of the difference. That's a, a tolerating that you don't have to be like me to be cool. Mm -hmm. But then the last stage is one that says, not only do I see that you're different, but I see the contribution that your difference can offer that mine doesn't give me as easily, mm -hmm. and I crave being associated with it. Mm -hmm. But that's a learning process that comes mm -hmm. from childhood through to adulthood, and it doesn't happen by magic. It's not a cognitive thing. It is an experiential developmental piece. So, so it's really a maturity thing also that as you learn that uh, with every preference there is a strength right. and there's a downside too and so if uh, you and I have a different preference then yeah. together we can be better right. than just by ourselves in some instances. If we use our energies mm -hmm. wisely, yes. Mm -hmm. you know? If we use our energies to try to control the other person and reshape them, no. <laughs> um, but that's just that mutual kind of respect that can come. So you have, you've really spent uh, a good part of your life in working with children and, and type in schools and certainly with your own family, but it yeah. sounds like it's just opened up a whole way to view the world that um, gives people insight about being better, I guess, is the, is the phrase that comes to, my, comes to mind. Well, I guess my natural type said the energies and contributions to this world had to focus on relationship development. And type was just the powerful tool to allow that to happen. So when people are just beginning to learn about type and, and uh, when we started talking, you were talking about going through a certification program. So in order to, to learn about type, all you really have to do is as an adult take the MBTI assessment or as a child take the MMTIC assessment so you can learn your type, but that's really just the beginning of the journey mm -hmm. for a person individually. But if someone wants to use the MMTIC you know, professionally or with others, mm -hmm. maybe not even in a professional situation, maybe in a, a family situation, right. then there's a certain uh, set of things that you have to learn, and that's done through the MMTIC certification program. Right, well you wanna transmit correct information. So there are some places out there, uh, websites that y you don't have to have anything verified to put it on the web. You can. So you'll see things like um, J's are neat and P's are messy. Mm -hmm. And that really isn't descriptive at all. It isn't at all what uh, was described in terms of understanding. It's whether I keep my options open or whether I like a planful approach to life. But if you don't know that, you'll accept what you see written as, oh, okay. Well, that's not, neat and messy are not two opposite goods. One is good and one is not good. Right. And the thing about type is they're always two opposite goods. So helping parents be able to sort through all of the information that's freely available versus what they might have to purchase, but the quality could be quite different mm -hmm. and that Having a program that is endorsed says that I've scanned it to make sure that it is true to the integrity of the theory, true to the integrity of the mission, which is to improve mm -hmm. relationships, and is embedded with strategies that are going to help you use it effectively. So you don't just read about somebody, but you know a tool for interacting with them better. Well, this has been a great conversation about you know how to use type in, uh, with families and we didn't quite get as much into school but what applies for families also applies for very often schools so um, well thank you we're so happy to have you cool. here in Gainesville with us thanks